who, um, who can't attend the whole thing. We're hoping that you will ask questions, freely use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. So if you haven't done that before, just click on the Q&A. You can type in questions and we will have 20 to 25 minutes after our three presenters to take as many questions as we can and we that will be moderated. Uh, so for now, uh, let's kick this off. Go into the chat box and enter where you're calling in from. So we have a sense of who we've got and where you all are. I think, yeah, we've got some people from out of state too, which is really cool. And I will hereby introduce Ginny Broadhurst, who is the director of the Salish Sea Institute and our moderator for the forum. So welcome, Ginny. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. And big shout out to Caroline for organizing this and putting it all together. Um, the queen of organization. Thank you, Caroline. It's fun to be here. Um, my role is pretty simple. I'm just going to introduce the speakers um, and uh, moderate the questions at the end. Um, the speakers have up to 20 minutes to give their presentations. Um, some of them may have time for a few questions um, before they end, but Rich has let us know that he he won't. He's going <laughs> to talk through his 20 minutes, and if you can um, certainly put questions in the in the Q and A box, and he could also have the opportunity to then answer um, by text, by writing rather than than orally. So um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Rich Osborne, who's the Aquatic Program Manager at University of Washington's Olympic Natural Resources Center in Forks, Washington. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me all right. And see, see my screen. Um, I thought I'd would mention that before I get started here, I also um, work with the Whale Museum in Friday Harbor, and really that's where I've worked most of my life. Um, and I'm still a research associate there, and actually currently the president for the board of directors. So my, my job here is to introduce you to um, Southern residents in a really fast fashion. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to try and do that um, utilizing my four favorite things that I love about orcas and some highlights from my um, doctoral thesis, which talks about the kind of issues they face. So <clears throat> an introduction to the indigenous fish eating orcas in the Salish Sea. First, I'm going to talk about the orcas as organisms, and then I'm going to talk about who are the southern resident killer whales and what are their basic issues. So. I'm judging from this audience that you guys know what orcas are really, really well. So I'm not gonna have to spend too much time. Here we have a juvenile and a calf in an aquarium and aren't they beautifully cute and wonderful. And here we have another calf out in the wild, right off a of Lion Kennel Lighthouse. As you know, orcas are dolphins, the largest dolphin on the planet and um, <clears throat> so they, they breathe the air, they give birth to live animal, uh, offspring, they nurse their young, and they always have to come up for a breath of air. That's the most important thing. But orcas aren't always just cute. Um, you have to keep in mind that orcas are actually the top predator in the ocean on a level that's equivalent to Tyrannosaurus rex on land, which luckily we don't see those guys anymore. But if you happen to be a southern sea lion um, <clears throat> in Patagonia, this is the most feared thing that could ever happen to you. And we have to keep that in mind when we think about cute orcas, that they're very powerful predators. One of the amazing things about orcas is that anywhere you go in the world, you find a different population of orcas living in um, feeding on different types of things, different vocalizations, different habits. And it's really like looking at different cultures of humans all over the planet. And as you can see, orcas occur basically everywhere. One of the most defining things about any organism is their feeding habits. And with orcas, this has really um, been a wonderful way to learn about how these different groups really are so different. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we have um, 
what we call the transients or Biggs whales, named after Michael Big, um, who specialize on eating marine mammals, particularly harbor seals and porpoises. Then we have salmon eaters here in the Northwest, like the southern resident orcas and the northern residents, who totally specialize on eating salmon and pretty much just Chinook. Offshore, we have the offshore um, population of killer whales that specialize on eating sharks. And because of the way the shark skin is like sandpaper, their, their teeth are worn down to the gum line. So they're really easy to identify. Other parts of the world, we have orcas that specialize on eating penguins. And in the North Atlantic, for example, we have orcas that specialize on eating Atlantic herring. <clears throat> so anywhere you go in the world, you have unique orcas and unique things about them. The four things though that I think are the most cool about organs of anything is their lifespan, their brains, their acoustic abilities, and their culture. And I'll briefly speak about each of those. In terms of life history, this is just how long does it take once they're born to mature and then how long do they live until they die. And if you look at orcas, they have the closest life history pattern to human beings of any other species on the planet. And this is really significant for lots of reasons. Um, it means that they learn their whole lives just like we do. They depend on culture just like we do. And so this is a really amazing thing about workers. The other very amazing thing, of course, is their brains. They, um, they are part of the most advanced brains on the planet in mammals amongst the cetaceans, the elephant, and the humans, and primates, we have all the best brains. Orcas actually have the largest brain um, of any of these organisms. It's the, literally the biggest brain on the planet. Even when you compare them with sperm whales, who are some 36,000 kilograms in body weight compared to an orca is just under 5,000, but they ha orcas actually have bigger brains than sperm whales. So that's very amazing. And we, we need to keep that in consideration when we think about what they do. All right, <clears throat> acoustics. I'm gonna play some sounds here. I hope you can hear them. <laughs> For the Southern residents, um, doing their calling. And they have a, a large vocabulary of calls, some that are unique to different pods. The whole population itself has a unique vocabulary. And if you look at different groups of orcas up and down the coast, they have different, completely different vocabularies of these types of calls. Yet they seem to use them to communicate with each other and, and, and um, hunt. The other thing that orcas have that's acoustically very amazing is their echolocation. Whoops. Let's see if we can make this work. Here you hear the echolocation. And they have the most amazing physiological mechanisms for receiving sound to their lower jaw and producing sounds in their blowhole and beaming out like a little beam for the echolocation. This all is very important when we think about orcas relative to the impacts that may be happening to them, particularly in terms of underwater sound. Finally, when you have long lives and big brains and complex communication, you end up with culture. And cultural isolation at orca leads to unique diets, vocalizations, social rituals that are only found in one orca population and not in the others. It's very much like we have with human beings. Here we have two classic things that Southern residents are particularly known for is their greeting ceremony and their intermingling ceremonies. But a culture is a double-edged sword. Um, on the one hand, a population with culture is capable of adapting to almost anything virtually overnight if all the leaders in the group agree that it's a good idea to do that. In the case of Southern resident orcas, it might be a good idea if the leaders decided to eat something besides Chinook salmon so that they would have a larger diet. But at the same time, agreements to change traditions in any culture is a hard thing to overcome sometimes, even in the face of certain disasters. 
And in terms of southern residents, we have not seen any sign yet that they're about to give up Chinook salmon um, in order to adapt better. It reminds me very much of our dependence on fossil fuels and how we're having a really hard time giving up that fish. So let's talk about the orcas, specifically the southern residents now. Who are the southern resident killer whales and what are their basic issues? Um, the first thing to realize about southern residents is they are the most thoroughly studied population of whales in the world. Um, dating back to the 70s when uh, Michael Big and Graham Ellis and Kim Balcom started doing initial photo identification. This has allowed us to study this population of whales in great detail, knowing exactly who's there every single year since the study started. It's very equivalent to what Jane Goodall had started with chimpanzees in Gombe. This information has also allowed us to identify where southern residents are relative to the other orca populations in the region. Southern residents tend to stay in the Salish Sea area. They do venture all the way up to the Queen Charlottes and definitely spend a lot of time going down the coast to California and off the mouth of the Columbia. The northern residents, who are also salmon eaters like the southern residents, spend most of their time at the north end of Vancouver Island and up into southeast Alaska. And then we have the offshores, those shark eaters, they're all over the place out in the open ocean, but they come in sometimes off the Strait of Juan de Fuca, sometimes at the Queen Charlotte's, and sometimes off the north end of Vancouver Island where they've been photographed and documented. And then we have the transients or the meat eaters who are really everywhere, sneaking around islands, around all the other types of orcas, feeding on um, seals and sea lions. So photo identification has allowed us to do this and has allowed us to understand who southern residents are relative to everybody else. Um, back in the 90s, I did my doctoral dissertation um, on the historical ecology of these guys, trying to figure out what it is that maybe had brought them to such a horrible state. So what I did was I looked at limiting, limiting factors in their existence and um, tried to hook them up with things that maybe human beings might have had some influence on over time. Um, <clears throat> then I, what I did was I, I went to a whole bunch of data sets and looked for trends in all kinds of variables, such as toxic exposure, underwater noise, vessel traffic, um, fishing and competition for salmon, and incidents where orcas were captured or killed. Um, and I plotted these over time to see if there were any trends. I'm going to go through and explain these trends a little bit um, in the next few slides, because it sort of tells the story of orcas, the southern residents here. So you can see almost everything here is still increasing up into the future. The only things that have been reduced a little bit is the capture and killing and the toxics have reduced in some cases. So the current orca population in the southern islands is a remnant of what was logically a population of at least 200 individuals in the early 1900s. Killings and captures reduced the population to around a third of this size by the mid 1970s and disrupted intergenerational reproductive patterns. These guys have been through so much in terms of capturing. Um, even before the capture era, there's really good evidence that they were used for target practice by, um, in World War II when, when um, pilots had to go out and find something to shoot at so they could practice their weapons. They used the Southern residents because they were hated by the fishing industry. So they had decades of being shot at and then the, came the capture era where some 48 individuals were removed from the population over a 10 year period. So you can see this is de demonstrated quite clearly in their population um, history here, starting at the end of the capture area era, they were down to around 70, 71 animals. Um, they immediately started to improve once the um, killing and captures ended. And then they went on a long rocky ride over the next several decades to unfortunately where they're back down to 74 whales at the moment. One of the other contributing factors besides the captures and killing is the toxic exposure that um, these guys have been uh, exposed to and accumulated in the population that makes it, these orcas some of the most toxic whales in the world. Um, one of the early things that was found out when we looked at this um, was that uh, male orcas whether they are transients or residents, always had higher levels of toxins, particularly PCBs and DDT, which are um, fat soluble, um, in their blubber layer. And the females consistently had less. Um, 
following up on this trend, um, several researchers did go through and figured out that actually what it seems to be is that females are able to unload their toxic load into their children offspring. And so their firstborn gets a large toxic load, they unload some more in the second and third and so on. And so the females are able to reduce the, the amount of toxic chemicals they're carrying, whereas males have a lifetime load that they must carry their whole time. This may lead to earlier mortality for males, most likely. For probably the most important thing to southern residents is their year-round salmon, which was probably never an issue for these whales for more than one, two years in a row until about the mid-1980s when overfishing and habitat destruction really reached a crescendo. Um, recent shortages are essentially permanent in the winter and early spring when resident shook chum, sealhead, and coho salmon are mainstay for the whales in coastal waters. Um, part of the problem here is that southern residents really depend on salmon more than anything else for their food. Um, unlike our whales in other parts of the world, they just won't give it up. And in particular, they really love Chinook. It dominates their diet. So almost everything they do is to try to figure out where is the Chinook. So they synchronize their ecology with the life cycle of salmon. And the critical period is when the salmon are out in the ocean. It's the key time that the southern residents need to know where they are. Here out of the Orca Task Force process, the Department of Fish and Wildlife produced a really cool analysis of the primary Chinook salmon runs that the southern residents depend on. And you can see there's runs down here in California, Oregon, particularly the Columbia, up in the British Columbia and so forth. And these are the fish that the whales are going out looking for all the time. Uh, let's go here. What happened? Hmm. How did I get a zoom? Oh. I'm gonna have to do this. Okay, that's good. There. Um, the thing to keep in mind with all of this salmon that are out there that the whales are looking for, it's also the international catch of all of these different countries are out there also competing with the whales for the salmon. If we look at this very complicated um, graph here, I want you to start down here at the bottom where you look at where, this is where the salmon go out into the ocean, into the international waters, leaving the Puget Sound and the Salish Sea area. And the red are the Chinook. They go out into this international convention area where Korea, Japan, Russia, Canada, and the United States are all getting their share of the salmon. The regulations around that start in international waters where there really isn't much in the terms of regulations whatsoever. Um, but there is the North Pacific Adronomous Fish Commission and the law of the sea, which can be applied to these, com these countries working together. Then we get to the U.S. Um, in Canadian areas where the Mag Magnuson Stevens Act and the Jones Act come in. Then we get to the U.S. Canadian distribution of salmon, where the Pacific Salmon Commission divides up the catch between the U.S. and Canada. Then the lower 48 states and the Pacific Fisheries Management Council work with the co-managers and the tribes to divide up what's left over from the Pacific Salmon Commission. And then the salmon that have been allocated here get allocated to the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife Commission, who then divide it up between commercial and recreational fishers. And then finally, the fish end up getting to the spawning grounds where we've been spending huge amounts of money lately to try to um, help increase their numbers. But they have an awful gauntlet to go through to get there. And if that wasn't bad enough, um, ocean conditions are also a huge part of what the whales and the salmon have to face. This is a, uh, showing the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is a cold water, warm weather sequence that has been going on forever, as far as we can tell. Um, and it shifts off and on. On top of that, we also have the very familiar El Nino, La Nina warm water and cold water processes that happen during due to different oceanographic conditions and can either um, overlay and overlay the PDO and can either make uh, a warm water period even worse or a cooler period even cooler. If we throw the southern resonance across this and look at how their increases in population go, we find that it actually correlates probably better with these cold water and warm water patterns than anything else. And that's because the Chinook salmon also correlate very closely with these warm water and cold water patterns. 
And then finally, finally, we have climate change. Um, back in 2013-14, suddenly we had this thing called the blob that formed off the coast of Washington and had a huge effect overlaying the El Nino and the, the Pacific Decadal Oscillations. And what's happened is the blob has not really gone away. It just recedes and gets stronger and recedes and gets stronger. And we still have a blob out there. But now we call them marine heat waves. And all of these factors have a huge impact on where the whales go to find the salmon, which, so you can see, it's probably the primary thing driving it. Nevertheless, we have one more impact that we need to keep in mind, and this is underwater noise from vessel traffic. And um, this has been a part of their environment for a long time, but whale watching really brought it to the foreground because whale watching vessels follow whales around and they can't really get away from it. So um, we have lots of whale watching traffic going on, but we also have, I want to go back to this and listen. Here's my little, oh, never mind. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was going to try to play you some shipping noise because shipping noise is also something that the whales can't get away from and is in, constantly in the background and is another factor in terms of interfering with their underwater acoustics. So um, <clears throat> if you look at the overall summary of what they've been through, you can see that um, Southern resident orcas have had a lot of different things happen to them over time that have probably permanently put them in this position. If we just look at it, incidences, back in the 30s, they had military target practice. In the 50s, they were commonly shot at. Um, in the 1970s, we had the, in the 60s, we had the captures going on. And then we had the growth of the whale watching industry. So all of these things have changed in their habitat over this period of time that are really individual incidents that are affecting them. But there's also been in habitat changes. The loss of, of salmon habitat, the loss of fish um, from overfishing, um, the cumulative to uh, release of toxic chemicals into their environment, um, the increasing ecosystem-wide perturbations like the, um, the blob, <clears throat> all of these things have been getting worse and worse over time and affecting the whale. One of the interesting things to think about from a cultural perspective is that there are males and females that have been around since the 30s who have experienced all of this stuff and in some way must be passing on some kind of understanding of it or some kind of adaptation to it to the next generations. But as I said, one of the biggest problems is not changing traditions. So maybe one of these fourth or third calves living in the 2000s will be the one that says, hey, wait a minute, let's not eat Chinook salmon anymore, let's try something else. Oh, Richard, um, here we are. Population, I think, is at 75. Over. Okay. Yeah, it's good. We're losing your audio, your um, audio, Rich. And I was going to say that the orchid task force and set in motion a whole lot of us trying to find this and so that we can see next in these other details. Thank you so much, Rich. You covered so much territory there. Um, and I know people have questions for you and they've put some questions in the Q&A box. And um, maybe uh, when Jacques starts talking, Rich could get, get in that Q&A box and actually just write some answers to, the, to those questions. So I am going to um, turn it over to Dr. Jacques White, who's the Executive Director of Long Live the Kings in Seattle. And he's gonna share his screen. And uh, Jacques, you've got 15 to 20 minutes. Yep. Cool, all time for you. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much uh, to the host for having me here. Uh, it's great to talk to folks. Um, that was a really great presentation by Rich, and there's a lot of slides that I had wanted to show, but 
didn't really have time in this context and Rich uh, did a great job, particularly talking about some of the oceanographic conditions. So uh, that'll support what I wanna talk about today. Um, I'm gonna talk about salmon in the Pacific Northwest, uh, particularly in the Salish Sea and some of the work that we're doing. Um, as a, I was a member of the Southern Resident Killer Whale Task Force and our organization, working with a lot of others, tried to add value and provide some recommendations for what to do with respect to salmon populations in Washington state to help orcas. So hopefully what I present tonight will be useful for you all as citizens to get a little bit deeper understanding. So uh, quickly, what are salmon? I think everybody knows that uh, Pacific salmon spawn in freshwater, uh, go to sea, spend a uh, certain amount of time at sea, get big, come back and spawn in the freshwater again. There's five main species of Pacific salmon. There's uh, sockeye, uh, Chinook, coho, uh, chum, and uh, pink salmon. And uh, those different species have different, different life histories, but even within a species, there are uh, many different life history variants. And I think that diversity is important, and it's something that I will touch on later. But for example, Chinook salmon have at least 14 different life histories. They can spend uh, uh, several months to a year in freshwater, go to sea, return after as, as soon as a year or stay in the Pacific Ocean for up to seven years or even more. And these uh, life history variations have developed over, you know, eon, eons, thousands and thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years even, to um, be resilient in the face of change of, in the environment and to take advantage of different conditions at different times. And one of the things that we've done to our salmon populations is to depress that diversity. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So what does salmon need? I think people know that salmon need cold waters and healthy rivers. They need uh, different habitat in the freshwater environment for spawning, for uh, rearing, for feeding, for resting, for hiding, and for growing uh, to be big enough to go out to sea. At least Chum and Chinook uh, spend some time in, in the estuary uh, developing and getting bigger and stronger and feeding before they go into the marine environment proper. So estuarine habitat, particularly for Chinook, is turning out to be more and more important. I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, and then, uh, as I said, uh, Chinook salmon at least can spend between one and seven or more years in the salt water rearing and gaining strength to return to their native rivers and spawn. Generally, the longer they stay in the marine environment, if the feeding conditions are good, the, the bigger they get. Uh, we tend to think of the marine system as being, and the ocean as being homogeneous. It's just a big mixing bowl, but actually there's a lot of variation in the marine environment, and these salmon populations have, uh, as you saw in the slide that was put up by Rich, uh, picked certain areas of the ocean that they go to year after year, and there's probably uh, microclimates in the marine environment that they find food and are able to succeed. Um, so why are salmon important? Well, I think that uh, Rich just made a really strong case for why Chinook salmon are particularly important for southern resident killer whales. They're also important for terrestrial environments. They support uh, wildlife from birds to mammals to insects to other fish. Uh, they also support coastal forests and bring nitrogen back from the ocean and fertilize our coastal forests and may be responsible for why some of our trees here in the Pacific Northwest are so large. Uh, tribal communities have relied on salmon for thousands of years. Uh, it's an important part of their culture, their economy, and their sustenance. Um, and then recreational and commercial fishing has been an important part of the Northwest, particularly since uh, Europeans colonized um, over 150 years ago. Uh, commercial fishing is less important now, but in the coastal communities where it still occurs, it's very, very important to those communities. And the recreational fishing economy, particularly based on boats, uh, boat purchases and and use and uh, people traveling around the region is an important uh, economic element of Western Washington. So how are salmon doing? Well, um, salmon used to be a lot bigger. Uh, this is a picture of Chinook salmon from the middle of the last century. Uh, and Chinook salmon just over the last 40 years have uh, reduced in average size by 50%. So this, the Chinook salmon that we're seeing now are on average half as big as the Chinook salmon that we would have seen 40 years ago. Now, if you're a southern resident killer whale, this is a critically important um, feature because every time they chase a salmon, they spend pretty much the same amount of energy, but they're getting half the calories. So you can see over time, this could have a big impact on their nutritional fitness and even their culture, that they have to spend more time chasing food and less time doing other things that they might be interested in. Um, 
Also, our salmon populations are less diverse. As recently as 1975, nearly half of the Chinook salmon returning to Puget Sound came back before August. And now, uh, as recently as 2010, that number is down to 12%. Again, if you're a southern resident killer whale and you're entering Puget Sound looking for Chinook salmon to eat, if they aren't coming back at that time, you're not going to have enough food. So um, this is a, a critically important issue from a whale's perspective. It's also an important issue for the population of salmon as a whole. Because if they, are, um, uh, if they experience different conditions when they re return to spawn, uh, perhaps, perhaps a spring population would be more successful than a fall population. But now we've essentially put almost all of our eggs in one basket. That has a lot to do with the shift from wild production, supporting fisheries and killer whales, to hatchery production, and particularly hatchery production of fall Chinook. Uh, salmon used to be significantly more plentiful than they are now. Uh, this is an a image from about 1910. The caption uh, from the image says, 30 million fish, Puget Sound, Washington. So we had very robust fisheries. Now these would not all be Chinook, they would be other species, but um, very large salmon runs returning to Puget, uh, Puget Sound, uh, British Columbia, and uh, Washington Coastal and Columbia Rivers. As recently as the mid-1980s, the number of Chinook salmon that were harvested by all fisheries uh, in Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia was nearly a million individuals. Um, by the time that Chinook were listed in Puget Sound under the Federal Endangered Species Act, that number had fallen by about 75 percent. So we were, uh, by 1999, when the Chinook were listed, we were harvesting about uh, 250,000 Chinook in both areas combined. And um, even though we, the fisheries managers did a pretty good job of dialing back fishing pressure, at least here in the Salish Sea, we did not see a rebound in the populations of Chinook. So what's going on? I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this graph. So this graph shows on the left panels, um, Chinook, coho, and steelhead marine survival for Puget Sound in the Strait of Georgia. And um, I'm sorry, the color is not right on the Washington, BC coast. The panel on the left, the green lines, are marine survival for coastal rivers of Washington and British Columbia, including the Columbia River in Washington. And what you can see is that there is, and, and marine survival is the percent of juveniles that return as adults. So what we can see is that marine survival was relatively high for coho, chinook, and steelhead in the Salish Sea. Uh, up until about the mid-1980s or the early 1990s, and then those marine survival rates fell off dramatically uh, and have not rebounded, particularly for steelhead. When we look at the coastal rivers, I don't know if you can see it because there's some boxes on the right, but the, 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 there was no uh, trend shown for any of the three species except for steelhead, which had a fall off in, in marine survival, but then it rebounded around 2000. Uh, it looks like the marine survival is really just driven for coho and chinook in the, in the uh, coastal runs by ocean conditions and not local conditions there. So there's something different going on in the Salish Sea with respect to marine survival compared to uh, the ocean, and it may be driving fisheries and food available for killer whales. So what affects marine survival of juvenile fish? Well, the climate drives the weather. The weather drives the food availability, and if juvenile fish are controlled by the availability, availability of their food resources, we call that bottom-up control. Fish are also affected by diseases and toxins in the environment, and they're also fed on by predators, uh, marine mammals, other fish, and birds. If they're controlled by predation, we call that top-down control. So in order to understand this problem with marine survival, which is a serious management issue, Long with the Kings and another nonprofit organization called the Pacific Salmon Foundation in British Columbia put together a program called the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. Um, and at the same time that we were having problems with Chinook marine survival, we we're also seeing declines in marine species of fish, some birds, prey items like herring, uh, zooplankton, and changes in habitat like eelgrass and kelp. Uh, we also saw that during that period of time an increase in the number of marine mammal predators due to the success of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, uh, increases in jellyfish blooms, uh, dinoflagellate or phytoplankton, noxious phytoplankton blooms, uh, significant increases in populations in the basin, also a net change in temperature. 
Um, in order to study this, we put together a program where we uh, had 200 investi over 200 uh, scientists or investigators involved, 60 different partners. We raised probably around $25 million combined in the US and Canada. Uh, ran this program for over five years in the two countries with one main question. What are the primary factors affecting juvenile Chinook coho steelhead survival in the Salish Sea marine environment? So here's our NASCAR slide. You can see we had participation in this program by pretty much all the federal agencies, state agencies, tribes, uh, nonprofit organizations, academic institutions, and some private companies. Boeing and uh, the Vulcan Corporation provided most of the private funding for the US side of the study. This was a quite a thorough investigation. We had well over 110 studies that spawned the entire inland shared waters of British Columbia and Washington State. And here's some of the results. So in freshwater, um, we found that um, juvenile Chinook migrating out of places like the Snohomish River were becoming uh, heavily impacted by uh, resident flame retardants in the environment to the point where it could affect their marine survival. And so um, Long of the Kings is working with uh, the Department of um, Washington, uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Department of Ecology, and the local PUD to try to understand what the source of this substance is because these are no longer um, allowed or, or in the product streams, but these are legacy chemicals that are in the environment. Similar problems, interestingly, in the Nisqually River, which is quite a bit less developed than the um, Everett, uh, the Snohomish River and Everett. Um, we also saw impacts in the marine and shallow water environment. I'm going to spend a little bit of time describing this graph. So on the left panel are the uh, frequency of out-migrating juvenile Chinook from the Green River and the Skagit River. Uh, and you can see that there are two peaks in out-migration, one in March and one in May, with a greater peak in the Skagit River in March than in May, and about equal sizes of distribution of fish coming out of the Green River. If we look at the contribution of these two migration uh, peaks by looking at uh, marks on the ear bones of Chinook when they return, we see that in the Green River, only about 1% of the returning adults were contributed by those early out migrants. But in the Skagit River, 36% um, of the returning adults were made up by those out, uh, the early fry out migrants. And if we look at this across a number of other basins, a trend seems to appear. So in the uh, developed Puyallup River, Estu uh, Puyallup River in Tacoma, we see 3% contribution to a returning adults by fry out migrants. Compare that to the Nooksack River, which is relatively undeveloped uh, near Bellingham and Bellingham Bay. We see 28% contribution of these early out migrants. Already showed the Green River and the Skagit River. The Cedar River had essentially zero contribution of early out migrants to returning adults, while the Cowichan River up on the east coast of the Vancouver Island had a 34% contribution. So the, it appears that a couple of things can be taken from this. One, um, high quality or higher quality estuarine habitat in places like the Skagit or the Nooksack or the Cowichan seem to favor uh, survival and return as adults of juveniles um, that migrate out early. And uh, estuarine habitat in areas that are developed like um, Harbor Island and the lower Duwamish River in downtown Seattle shown here in the panel um, have much less contribution. And, the, and a question for us in terms of restoration is, how much effort is it worth putting into restoring habitat in some of these urbanized areas? In other words, can we move the needle at some kind of cost effective level by doing estuary restoration? One of the things we also found is that growth is much higher in um, uh, Chinook. Uh, when, when we have much higher growth rates in Chinook, we have much higher marine survival. And what we're finding, this is a gra uh, figure here that shows that growth rates are typically higher in North Puget Sound than they are in South Puget Sound, and typically the highest around the San Juan Islands where the juvenile Chinook are feeding on marine invertebrates and forage fish. So we are learning that forage fish populations are critically important as a direct food supply for Chinook salmon while they're in Puget Sound. One of the things that we are concerned about is the potential mismatch due to some of the climate change factors that, that um, uh, 
that we were hearing about earlier. And, and if the concern is, is that if the seasonality is changing, if the weather's getting warmer sooner or the fresh water's melting and coming down rivers uh, from snow sooner into the marine environment, that we might see plankton blooms occurring at an earlier time. And if the salmon populations are not coming out of the rivers at the right time to match with the food availability, we could start to see poor survival. And we think that is what's going on with Chinook and Coho, at least, in Puget Sound. Um, we're learning that harbor seals are likely more important, uh, are likely eating uh, more salmon and steelhead. This seems to be particularly a, a serious problem for steelhead in the Salish Sea and in Puget Sound, but also uh, is occurring in significant amounts for Chinook and Coho. Um, if we look at models based on the population changes of harbor seals over the period from 1970 to 2015, what we see is that, uh, and looking at gut contents of uh, sa Chinook salmon in seals in the Strait of Georgia, we can uh, estimate that um, there were about a million juvenile Chinook removed by harbor seals in 1970, and now nearly 8 million juvenile Chinook being removed by harbor seals in Puget Sound uh, today. Um, models also indicate that if you, if you model the survival rates, the potential survival rates for those juvenile Chinook that are being removed by harbor seals, that it could be on a par with the number of adult uh, Chinook salmon that are removed by resident killer whales in Puget Sound and significantly higher than the total commercial and recreational catches in the basin. So this is a significant amount. Um, we don't think that this is even the most important factor for controlling uh, Chinook uh, marine, juvenile marine survival, but we think it is an important factor. One of the things that we also learned looking at steelhead populations in um, uh, coming out of the Nisqually River is that when you have higher abundances of anchovies in the marine environment in South Puget Sound, you have higher marine survival of steelhead from the mouth of the Nisqually River to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. In years when we had low anchovy abundance, we had low survival. We don't think this is a result of the steelhead eating anchovies directly, but we think it's an alternative prey source for seal, harbor seal predators, and that when we have abundant other forms of uh, fish in the environment, steelhead uh, have a better chance to survive. So how does this work helping orcas? Well, I think that um, we, we heard about how important it was for uh, salmon to feed orcas as one of the critical limiting factors in addition to noise and toxics. Um, so if we can increase the uh, marine survival of Chinook and other salmon species, so we return more salmon to the environment, we think that we can improve the conditions for killer whales. And as part of the uh, governor's Southern Resident Orca Task Force, about 20% of the recommendations for the orca recovery report to, uh, that went to the legislature for, for funding came directly from this marine survival project work. So what are some of the possible solutions? Well, um, addressing predation. If we can, one of the things that's going on is that we have in parallel with the increase in marine mammals like uh, harbor porpoises and harbor seals in Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia, we also have an increase in the numbers of Biggs killer whales in the region. So we should be tracking if there's a possibility for Biggs killer whales to serve as a control on the populations of predators of juvenile salmon. Um, we found that the Hood Canal Bridge is a serious impediment to survival to juvenile steelhead migrating out of Hood Canal. About 50% are lost at that site. So are there some things we can do to, to alter the structure of infrastructure like the Hood Canal Bridge to improve survival? Um, we can address both predation and food limitation by looking at our hatchery practices. Currently, we release all Chinook salmon from hatcheries, which provides about 80% uh, of the Chinook returning to Puget Sound as adults within a two-week window in May. Should we be looking at changing or spreading out the time of release so we don't ring a dinner bell essentially for predators? And also, if the uh, seasonality of the food resources in the marine environment is changing for Chinook, can we um, uh, create a more diverse population of hatchery fish and also looking at wild populations and things we can do uh, to restore wild populations that maybe have a different, um, a different life history to increase the chances of survival and productivity of our Chinook. Uh, addressing predation and food limitation. Restoring forage fish seems like a, a, a great idea because not only do we 
uh, provide direct food supply for juvenile Chinook in the system, but we can also provide an alternative food source for the predators that, that are there. More herring is a, is a win-win for Puget Sound in the Strait of Georgia, at least for Chinook salmon survival. Uh, as I showed, it looks like estuary habitat is important. So continuing to find opportunities to restore habitat is important for that, for that um, activity. Addressing pollution and uh, legacy pollution is important. And then removing barriers. One of the things that was funded as part of the Southern Resident, or recommended for funding as part of the Southern Resident Killer Whale recovery was removal of the Middle Fork Dam on the Nooksack River, which opened up 16 miles of spawning and rearing habitat for steelhead and Chinook. Um, I guess we won't have time for questions, so I will uh, get off now and answer questions later. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jacques. That was awesome. And um, there are a bunch of, of great questions in the Q&A. And um, if you could get in there and maybe uh, take a look at those and, and answer some and just by, by writing. Um, and we'll bring um, Dr. De Deborah Giles up. And she does go by Giles. Um, and Giles has, wears a bunch of different hats. Uh, she is the Science and Research Director at Wild Orca in Friday Harbor. She's a killer whale researcher at University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology, and she's a resident scientist at University of Washington's Friday Harbor Labs. And she has a really cool program that she's going to share with us. And um, let me take the spotlight off of Jacques. Get rid of your video there. And Giles, let's, you're on and you're sharing your screens. Great, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, boy, those were two really fantastic talks and um, just a great setup for what I'm going to talk about. So thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to participate. Um, in this uh, ORCA recovery event, uh, or ORCA awareness event. Um, so I titled, uh, this is my newest uh, name for what we do, uh, this Everybody Loves a Pooping Whale. It's kind of a, a funny tongue, uh, tongue in cheek uh, nod to the fact that if you have a pooping whale, uh, most likely you have a whale that's been eating. And so it's a little bit of an indirect um, you know, comment about the fact that we need to have whales that are eating and then uh, then they poop and that's what we want. So uh, as was mentioned, I'm with the uh, University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology and that's the research that I'm going to be talking about tonight. So um, the Southern residents, uh, has, as has been mentioned, uh, have a wide range. They go up uh, to the top of the Haida Gwaii Islands and occasionally even farther up. Um, and then all the way down at least to Monterey. And so that's a wide area that they cover, um, mostly right along shore. And so a lot of research has been done on these guys um, for the past 45 plus years. And, um, but we focus our attention just right in that uh, spot in uh, what used to be termed their summer and fall territory, although that's changing significantly. So the southern residents were listed in 2005 in the United States, and the three main identified threats being lack of quality and quantity prey, uh, the effects of toxicants or pollution in the environment by accumulating up the food chain, uh, and uh, also the impacts of vessel presence and associated noise. So uh, Dr. Wasser, Sam Wasser, started studying these southern residents uh, back in 2000, really 2006, uh, trying to understand whether or not he could apply a really interesting, unique way of uh, researching these animals um, in this marine realm, uh, taking what he had learned from working with colleagues on the East Coast studying North Atlantic right whales, uh, using scat detection dogs to locate that, those species um, uh, non-invasively. And so he started doing this research in the uh, kind of the inland waters of the Salish Sea, piloting the program in 2006. And um, I came on board in 2009 as the vessel captain at that time. So the black circle there shows where essentially where our current range goes, although we do go up all the way to where these uh, black arrows are. Uh, that's a bit of a stretch for our uh, current boat. Um, but ultimately, we're hoping to expand our research out here to the west of us um, in order to maximize the time with the whales. The whales are spending um, a lot more time out there at the mouth of the Strait of Juan de Fuca 
and up and down, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but up and down the west coast of Vancouver Island, um, pretty much every day when they're not here in the inland waters uh, between May and October, uh, a lot of those days they've been seen along uh, this area in the blue, in the blue circle. So here's some pictures just to um, set the stage and um, kind of just uh, remind people, not that everybody need, or anybody needs reminding, but just how incredibly amazing these animals are. So this picture up here in the top right, that's an older picture and that's what we used to get to see quite a lot with the whales grouped together, um, spending time along the west side of San Juan Island, uh, doing the west side shuffle. That used to be, when I started studying these guys in 2005 and before that, it was a daily occurrence. Um, and that's changed significantly, especially since 2013. Um, so the Center for Wild Research, as um, Rich Osborne mentioned on the, in the first talk, uh, the center has been studying these animals since the mid 70s. And uh, this is an updated graph from them that I received today showing the population change over time. And one of the things to point out is, is that these uh, whales are being impacted by and external pressures differently amongst the different pods. So um, by far, LPOD is being, uh, has been, uh, has experienced the biggest declines since 1995 when it became really evident uh, that the population was declining. Uh, LPOD has been on a steady downward trajectory since 1995. KPOD is also very, very concerning um, given that we haven't had a, a baby born in KPOD since 2011 that has lived. Um, J-Pod has really been carrying the change uh, in the population um, since 1995, where we had a fairly nice increase until uh, 2006, and then there was a, a decline after that, and we're a bit on, on, on a decline still here. Uh, losing one of the uh, just phenomenal members of the community, uh, L41, father of a many, many offspring, uh, losing him at the beginning of the year was tragic. And I just leave this picture in here at the bottom because um, it's this is a year that uh, one of my first years studying them. And this shows J2 and J1, some of the most iconic and well photographed uh, whales on the planet. So that's the J, uh, J2s or J14s there. So as Jacques mentioned, um, you know, the Southern resident killer whales um, co-evolved eating Chinook salmon that were significantly bigger. These are pictures from the turn of the century taken, um, uh, taken in Washington state. Uh, and these are showing massive, massive salmon. The one, uh, the image on the left are showing 60, high 60 to seven to mid 70 uh, pound salmon. And the image on the right is um, are, are salmon that are over a hundred pounds each. So as Jacques mentioned, these whales um, are, this is what they evolved to find. This is what they, you know, one or, uh, you know, between one and three of these would have easily sustained um, different members of the population. Now, if we're talking about animals that have to eat 300 to 400 pounds of salmon per day, depending on the sex and age that the animal is, the whale is, um, and our average Chinook salmon in Washington state right now is between 12 and 15 pounds or possibly even less right now, and that's a lot of energy that's expended by the Southern residents to catch enough fish to, to sustain their health and, um, and not enough to, in a lot of cases, sustain pregnancies. And I'll get to that in a little bit. So this is an um, image put together by Jane Kogan uh, with the Southern Resident Killer Whale Project. And essentially, this is a, um, her depiction of data that's taken from the Albion Test Fishery website uh, you are, um, this data is freely available and she just has um, put it into a graph that's really understandable. Um, and we can really see the change over time um, with this, again, downward trajectory of fish heading for the Fraser River in Canada, which really is likely the, uh, a big component as to why we had so-called resident killer whales from May to October, is because these whales would have been coming into the inland waters chasing fish bound for the Fraser and also rivers like the Skagit uh, in uh, Washington state. This is an image that um, I'm borrowing from the Orca Behavior Institute. And um, this was really, uh, I both like it and hate it. I like it because it's a very great depiction of what's been happening. And I hate it because of what it's showing us, which is that we're going through these massive um, changes in the uh, presence of the Southern residents in their designated summer core critical habitat. 
2013 absolutely marked the year where things changed. This is a year when the whales were in the inland waters less than half the amount of time that they normally were um, up to that date. And since then, change, uh, things have been really changing significantly. Um, we've been hitting these benchmarks, these really unfortunate benchmarks for the last couple of years. As uh, stated there, uh, with uh, whole months going by where we don't see any members of the Southern resident community. So this is very a very disturbing trend. Uh, this is another graph that um, I both love and hate to show. I like to show it because it's very clear what's happening. And what this is showing is if you just look at all those uh, colorful lines on the bottom and kind of squint your eyes and make that into one big shape with peaks and valleys, um, that's the coastwide, uh, coastwide abundance of Chinook salmon that include rivers all the way from Southeast Alaska to the Central California which would be rivers that the southern residents might be looking to intercept fish from. And what it's showing on the top, those purple bars are, uh, the, the negative uh, bar chart there at the top, are showing um, deaths per year in the southern resident killer whale community. And so in a nutshell, when we have low numbers of salmon, we have high numbers of southern resident killer whale deaths. Um, there are obviously a lot of other confounding factors here, but the fact is, is that with the, uh, the lack of uh, quality and quantity prey, the Southern residents are uh, losing their lives to, um, to myriad different uh, threats that are working synergistically against them. Um, this is a picture. Also, this data is available to the public. You're welcome to go and look at it on a daily basis. And this really explains what happened in, um, in 20, uh, 2020 in that we had very, very low numbers of fish coming back uh, to the Fraser. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about what the Albion test fishery is exactly um, later, but um, it's, uh, it's a measure of the fish coming back to the Fraser River. And then these higher numbers here start to show why we had the Southern residents back in the inland waters in the month of September. And it's, it's really that simple. There were fish here for them to come in and, uh, and stay for. So another graph showing um, what is uh, happening with the Southern residents fish, uh, what's happening with their menu. And um, again, this is very, um, very, a lot of information that goes into this. Um, again, it's uh, readily available to the public and I can point you in the right direction. But the point here of showing this is to show you that a large portion of fish caught in Alaska is not bound for Alaskan rivers. So these are not native to Alaska and yet they're being uh, caught there and termed uh, Alaskan caught wild salmon uh, in, the, in the markets. And so that's a, um, that's a whole nother hour long conversation. But um, just wanted to definitely say that looking at fisheries management, how and when and where we catch fish is important if we're uh, really serious about talking about recovering the Southern resident killer whales who rely on this fish. So this is some data put together by our colleagues at NOAA. And this was from uh, a number of years ago, but it's, uh, it paints a, a vivid picture of the Southern residents occupying the mouth of the Columbia River uh, in the springtime, uh, um, kind of winter and into the spring. And it really highlights the importance of Columbia River Chinook salmon for the Southern residents. So what are we doing to try and understand what's happening? Uh, again, with the University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology, uh, we seek to use non-invasive tools to research, educate, and really drive um, understanding about what's happening with endangered species around the world by using non-invasive techniques to do that research. Um, so Dr. Sam Wasser pioneered the use of scat detection dogs in 1997. Um, on terrestrial mammals and then uh, moved out at the um, around 2000 to study, as I mentioned, North Atlantic right whales on the East Coast and then back here um, in the early 2000s to study Southern resident killer whales. And um, this is a picture of our, uh, our most used dogs. We've had a number, uh, maybe two or three other ones that we tested out, but um, over, over the course of, the, of the, our study since 2006, um, but these are definitely the ones that have spent the most amount of time on the water. So down there in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, arguably our most famous uh, scat detection dog, whale scat detection dog, Tucker. Uh, he retired in 2017, uh, well, really for, for real, 2017. Um, and then we had Jack and Dio down there at the bottom for a couple of years. Um, we've had uh, my, my companion animal, Eva, 
um, working with us now for two years. She's into her, uh, 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 towards the end of her second year. And um, she's just doing a phenomenal job. So we're really excited by, um, by the fact that she's uh, worked out for us. Um, here's a picture of all of our current dogs right now at the Center for Conservation Biolo Biology Conservation Canines Program. And all of these dogs are doing amazing work, uh, mostly in Washington State right now, um, down in the eastern, central eastern Washington, looking um, at carnivores and looking for the presence of wolves. So why use dogs to find killer whale scat? Number one, it's non-invasive. We can stay really far away from the animals, the whales. After the dogs are trained on the, on the fecal samples, they can, we can be up to a half mile or a mile more away from the back end of the whales where they would have left us a sample. So we don't really have to get anywhere near them in order to do the work that we need to do uh, on the water, which is to collect those samples so that they can be sent back to the lab for analysis. And uh, I've got some great pictures taken by some folks, friends on the island um, uh, doing different things. Um, this is a picture from Ken Ray of Spirit of Orca uh, taking a photo of us off of Pile Point in uh, uh, off West Side San Juan, uh, where the whales spent a lot of time um, this year, more than they have in the last uh, probably three years. Um, so this year with COVID, um, I was unable to have uh, the, our regular crew on board. And thankfully, my husband, Jim, was able to step in. He's been a backup driver for us uh, since I started working for the program in 2009. And this year marked the difference in that we get to, um, get to work together. And so that's been a really amazing experience to be able to work as a family unit um, out there um, doing this, this conservation work. So I'm very thankful for him to be, have been uh, stepped in and, and want to give a shout out to my regular crew, who I uh, do miss on the boat quite, quite every day. It's a lot different trying to do all the work that we do out there with just two people. So um, this is what Eva looks like when she's actually on a scent. So this picture is just us cruising around uh, downwind of the whales and uh, she's alert and smelling, but she's not on a scent. And here we can see that she's definitely on a scent. She's reaching over the bow. She's trying to get um, as close to that scent as she can. And then when she smells it, she has a change of behavior and turns back and that tells us that we're very near and or we need to turn the boat into the wind. Um, so that was a successful sample that was collected in, um, in July. So thanks very much to Amanda, um, Amanda who was able to send these photos. Um, I'm going to try and get through this quickly so that we can have questions at the end, but this in a nutshell is what we do. We operate the, uh, the boat downwind of where the whales were um, as I said, um, usually at least we start out about a half a mile away from where the whales just left an area, so we're not near them at all. And then we operate the boat downwind, and as the boat is traveling um, downwind towards, uh, just in this case, per uh, parallel to where the whales were, when, the, uh, when we hit the, the scent cone, um, the dog has a change of behavior, and that's when we know to turn the boat into the wind. Um, Poop on the water is different than terrestrial fecal samples in that those ones don't move and ours do. Um, and so it is, it tends to be kind of a jockeying motion back and forth, um, watching the dog very closely at this point for the change, the really tiny changes in behavior that they're telling us in order to know when to turn back into the wind again. And ultimately they end up bringing us right up alongside the sample. So it's a pretty amazing, um, amazing situation. And um, when we get it, it's a, it's a, a very joyous occasion when we, when we are able to find these. As I've described it, it's like a, finding a needle in a haystack, but the needle's moving and so is the haystack. So um, this is the uh, second most, uh, um, well, first or second most popular question I get, the first one being, what does it smell like? Southern resident killer whale um, poop usually smells like slightly old fish, which I guess it is. Um, these samples are taken from a number of years ago and they show very, very amazing fatty rich samples that are hanging at the surface and hanging together for a long time. Um, we've gotten some of these this year, which is really interesting. I'll show you some pictures in a second. Um, in past years, uh, we've been uh, kind of just down to finding these little bits and pieces in the water and none of these larger pancakes. Um, and I just wanted to, hopefully this will work, I wanted to show um, any kids out there or anybody interested in what Eva, why Eva does this work. This is what our dogs are working for. This is what they live for. 
So she's fairly animated. She could do that for a long time. Uh, we let them play for about five minutes and then uh, they usually, uh, she'll go into the kennel on the boat so that we can collect samples and, um, and um, you know, do, do our job. Um, so these are some samples I thought I would show that we collected this year. Um, this sample on the right is a sample like we have been collecting a lot of in the last couple of years. This is a sample from JPOD that was collected in uh, July after they had been in the inland waters for a number of days um, versus what we would have seen in the past. These sample, uh, the one on the top was collected on September 5th. Um, it was either from a J-pod or a K-pod whale. I'm not sure because they were all mixed up. This was the day that they came in and had uh, what I do believe was a super pod, meaning uh, every single member of the Southern Resident Killer Whale Clan were together. Um, that's the definition of a super pod as opposed to just a gathering if you've got members of all three pods. Um, I have been told that all members were accounted for and this was the day after the first baby was born of the, of the year. And I'll show you a picture of uh, that, that boy, uh, that baby boy whale in a minute. Um, the one on the bottom was really interesting and I've never seen anything like this one. I immediately sent, sent Sam a picture of this when we were still on the water to show him uh, and get his opinion about this. And um, this sample at the bottom, you can see it uh, after I was trying to, it's a long story, but anyway, suffice it to say, this is after these samples had been sun down in our centrifuge. And you see that really thick, dark oil on the top. And so Sam and I both uh, concurred that it's quite possible that this was uh, not, not uh, from a Chinook salmon, but possibly from a cod, a black cod, or also known as sable fish. So I'm very excited to be able to get this back to the lab and um, see what they can find from this sample. These are taken from K-Pod Animal. Uh, and so this is the first day that they had come back in after being um, out on the outer coast. So this is just gonna be really fascinating. What were they eating out there on September 26th or 25th? And uh, just quickly, some of the things that we can find from this. Um, who, it, who it was, uh, who pooped the sample out, what, uh, you know, then therefore what sex, if they're female, uh, if they're pregnant, not only if they're pregnant, but how pregnant, also if they're getting enough to eat, um, what kind of stress uh, levels are they, um, are they exhibiting? Also things like parasite, microplastics now we're getting into, and Sam's new grad student, Will Sano, is going to be looking at microbiome. Um, and really studying the, um, how that is impacting, how the health of the gut biome is impacting the overall health of the Southern residents. So as I hinted, um, I think most everybody on this call would know, but we have had two successful, knock on wood or something harder, uh, babies born in September. Uh, we had a baby born to J35, uh, which was the mom that lost her baby in 2018. Um, and carried the baby around for 17 days. She successfully gave birth to a male on uh, September 4th. And then another young mom, uh, J41, also known as Eclipse, gave birth to uh, what we think is her second baby. Um, and we don't know the sex of this one yet. Uh, J41, uh, as far as I know, is the youngest animal that's ever given birth in the wild um, in that she was she got pregnant when she was eight and gave birth to her first offspring when she was just 10. Um, and so this is just gonna be a really um, amazing family to watch, fingers crossed for both of these babies. And fingers crossed for a couple of other females that were identified um, by the Center for Well Research and John Durbin and Holly Fernbach uh, researchers doing drone analysis of a couple of other animals that uh, look to be pregnant as well. So we're hopeful for those guys to be um, successful giving birth to live babies. Yeah. Shout out to my amazing crew um, and our volunteers uh, over the years. These are just our most recent volunteers, some of them uh, JB, going back to the beginning. Um, and uh, we really, really could not do this work without them. And we certainly couldn't do the work that we have been doing without our funders. So most recently from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, also known as Vulcan, um, is our current funder, and then uh, down there along the bottom, some of our most recent funders. 
So thank you very much. Thank you so much. What an awesome presentation. Um, we have a bunch of questions that are coming in and um, I'm gonna bring up our other speakers. And while I do that, um, there's a question about how this, this summer, um, like whether you saw changes um, because of uh, COVID and less boat traffic. Um, there was there was less boat traffic initially um, right after the governor di um, uh, issued the original stay home stay safe order um, there was there were almost no boats on the water and there was also less uh, shipping uh, vessels so the larger shipping vessels but that quickly changed um, really quickly changed um, we had maybe a month I'm guessing and I'm stretching to maybe a month and a half of having uh, no boats or very few boats. And we did get some funding from National Fish and Wildlife Federation to try and get out there and collect samples from the Southern residents when there were no or low boats in order to look at uh, uh, stress uh, in relation to vessel presence and associated noise. Unfortunately, the whales weren't here either at that time. Um, since then, uh, vessel traffic has increased markedly. It's very obvious that uh, there are uh, new boaters out there. Uh, as I understand, uh, new and used boat sales have gone up by 33%. It's probably more than that. Uh, the trade association didn't know, that was the number that they have right now, but they did uh, suggest that that was gonna be higher by the end of the year. And so uh, any offset that we had at the beginning of COVID has definitely been, uh, has gone the other way with uh, increased vessels. And I just wanna share one anecdote. Um, I, we as a research vessel out there are, you know, we try and um, do what we can to try and help um, not put pressure on the Southern resident killer whales or any other mammals that we're, that we're doing research on. Um, and so to, to that end, researchers have been coordinating very well with each other this year to stay away um, as much as possible from any one group of whales. Um, what we have had to do more than any other time in the past is literally pull our research flag out of its holder to wave down private boaters that are careening recklessly through uh, groups of whales. And I've been so discouraged to see that. And in some cases, it's clear that they have no idea, um, even though there might be whale watch uh, organizations out there or researchers out there um, some people are absolutely completely clueless, but there's also, uh, unfortunately, a, a contingent of people that are that are aware of the whales being there, and they are flagrant in their activity and actions around them, and that's very disturbing. And unfortunately, there's only so much that WDFW and organizations like the Whale Museum Soundwatch program can do to intercept these bad boaters, but certainly mm -hmm. those organizations are trying. Yeah, yeah, that is super discouraging. Um, I appreciated one of, well, so much of these presentations. Um, I'm the director of the Sailor Sea Institute at Western Washington University for those who may have missed uh, introductions initially. I really am more in the policy arena and I appreciate the maps that show um, and the projects that are looking at, at the Sailor Sea as a whole international water body. Um, the Sailor Sea Survival Project, really one of the few that are addressed, you know, looking at the whole ecosystem. Um, and that, that border, that sh it, it literally is an international shipping channel, and that just adds to the complexity of this and all of our solutions that need to take place on both sides of the border. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated uh, world out there for orcas. There's a bunch of great questions. Uh, I'm going to shoot one that has to do with hatcheries. Um, and I, I'm not sure, maybe this is to Jacques. Um, you know, there's um, hatcheries are slated for budget increases in the, the state budget, um, and there'll be more production. Could you speak to whether you see any additional increase in hatchery salmon as um, helping to provide some additional prey for, for orcas in the Salish Sea? Mm -hmm. So as part of the, uh, thanks for the question, as part of the Southern Resident Killer Whale Task Force, there was a lot of discussion about how to increase hatchery production and even whether we should. Um, hatchery production was reduced over the last 10 or 15 years uh, in order to take offline hatchery production that was putting wild salmon at risk because Chinook, or list, Chinook and Steelhead are listed under the Endangered Species Act. So there was an effort to where we were concerned about competition between hatchery fish and wild populations to reduce, reduce production in some areas. Um, 
also, there have been significant funding cutbacks at Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. So some of the problems were, or reduced hatchery production was a result of lack of funds. Um, there was a robust discussion in the, in the prey task force, uh, the, the task force prey work group in particular about what to do about hatcheries. And the initial product, uh, production increases were like, okay, what hatcheries have extra space? Where can we get fish? Um, that evolved over time to what kinds of salmon do killer whales need and where do they need them? So the diagram, I think it um, was rich that showed it, which, which had, you know, where, which populations of salmon are the southern resident killer whales, depending on as far as we know, and then to try to focus increases in production on that. So the final proposal that came forward for hatchery increases all over Washington state, including the Columbia, was reasonably well thought out and had uh, different species like chum and chinook and different life histories of chinook represented, spring runs and fall runs. Um, I do have concerns about sacrificing Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife hatchery policies um, in order to increase production. In other words, do we really have to rescind our hatchery reform policy that was developed for wild fish recovery in order to achieve increased production for Chinook? And I mean, the, the, <clears throat> the bottom line is, is that uh, Long Live the Kings, who we actually run two hatcheries and partner with the state and tribes who also run hatcheries, our concern is, is that we need more diversity in our Chinook populations and our salmon populations as a whole, whether they're in hatcheries or whether they're in, in the wild. And that's in order to address changes in the environment, both freshwater and saltwater, in order to achieve um, better survival and more resilience in the face of what's a clearly uh, and substantially changing climate. And so just increasing production, I fear, will not uh, res yield the results that we want for either fishing interests, um, the salmon's persistence over time, or our southern resident killer whales. Thank you. Um, hey, there's a question that maybe you should go to Rich, which is just how long do um, orcas live? I think that Giles could answer that as well. But um, <clears throat> what it boils down to is the oldest known photograph of a whale is what you have to go on. And if it's an old whale to begin with, then you assume that it's been alive for a while. Um, most of our hard data is really based on known birth dates and, and following these whales for their entire lives. And we're approaching 50 years with a whole lot of individuals right now that we're tracking. But <clears throat> if we go back through the early photo identification work, um, it looks like that, you know, 80 years is not out of the question for some of the old females. And the males can certainly live to be in their um, late 50s, like good old J1. So um, very much like our lifespan, like I was saying, I think that's one of the coolest things about them. Yes, it's, it sure is to think of what they've endured over that time. Um, there's, there was a couple of questions about the, just the difference in feeding habits between um, the, the mammal eating um, northern whales and the Chinook exclusive diet of the southern residents. Um, does somebody want to just speak to why that is um, and maybe explain why the different populations are, are faring so differently? Um, I can I can take that. Um, so we've got the northern resident fish eating killer whales, the southern resident fish eating killer whales, and then the northeast Pacific uh, mammal eating killer whales, and then the offshore guys. Uh, most likely in evolutionary time, the animals uh, differentiated uh, in what they were going to be eating in order to uh, well possibly they were completely separated from one another. Uh, for a time, but also the fact that they eat on different uh, layers of the of the food chain or within different areas of the food web uh, means that there's less competition amongst individuals. So um, over time, that's adapt that's an adaptive strategy for um, avoiding conflict. When you've got two animals that are equally um, powerful, um, it behooves them both groups to find other ways to not be in competition with with one another. And so that's part of it. There's probably a lot more other things going on. 
Um, with regard to the mammal eaters, um, I mean, pardon me, the fish eaters, um, you know, Rich was talking and I always hold out hope that some, you know, young whippersnapper is going to uh, just go against mom's will and go ahead and, and take a bite out of a harbor porpoise um, or a doll's porpoise because they certainly catch them and kill them. Um, they play with them to death, but they don't eat them. So far, there's no evidence that they're, they've ever taken a bite or uh, out of a pink salmon for that matter. And so those are kind of two ends of the spectrum, a bony, you know, uh, lipid poor um, pink salmon versus a nice chubby um, harbor porpoise neonate, which is what they tend to kill the newborn babies, interestingly. But, you know, I, I think that it, it, it ultimately now comes down to culture. They, do, they just, they eat what their mom tells them they can eat. And if we have time for an anecdote, I've got a quick one uh, uh, that goes to a story about uh, mammal eat it, eaters, if we have time. I can't see my clock with this. Um, we, uh, we should probably get to a couple more questions okay, and then maybe you can come back to that okay. one. Sounds great. Um, there's a question, are, are PCBs still a concern? Who's played Jacques? Can uh, well, you know? I would say they are for same for, for juvenile sam for juvenile Chinook in places like Commencement Bay and and Elliott Bay, where we have Superfund sites and we have salmon migrating out, uh, they are they are a concern. Uh, although PC, as I understand it, PCB concentrations in at least uh, marine mammals like harbor seals are declining. In fact, I I, I have a joke, and I don't know, maybe maybe. Um, Rich can speak to this, but maybe the reason why it took big killer whales a while to come in and start eating seals is that they were waiting for the PCB load to go down so that they wouldn't get a headache. That's a joke. Sort That's of. a good, good joke. Yeah, it could be. Um, they certainly came in from California and ate all the harbor seals in Hood Canal for a couple of years now. Um, so yeah, I would just say, I, I think it's really cultural. You're born into your family, you eat what your mom tells you to eat, and that's that. And obviously, since there's so many different types of food eating that killer whales do, at some point, somewhere along the line, somebody changes their mind or goes off with the group and says, looks like this is all we got to eat, let's start eating sharks. I don't know. It's a, it's a wonderful question and something that orca biologists will spend the rest of their lives thinking about, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of fascination with poop, um, and um, before I tell you the question, I'm going to just say to Ruth, let's let's uh, wait until like 6:58 before we go to that closing slide because we've we've got a couple more questions to handle. Um, so, Giles, if you're collecting um, whale poop as far away as a mile, how do you know which whale it came from? Um, sometimes we can't know that until after it goes to the lab. Um, so the, the fecal samples can be um, queried against a catalog of known DNA that uh, NOAA has been putting together and uh, um, we can, they've given us access to that as well. So, um, but then sometimes, uh, you know, we try and get behind groups of whales. Uh, I always say more butts means more potential for poop. Um, but sometimes we only have one whale that we um, see or can, can, can uh, work with for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, then obviously we would know that it came from that animal. But often we don't because it does come from a, a group. Mm -hmm. Not until later. Um, and as far as the seals go, um, any uh, ideas or recommendations of what to do about the seal issue? is a question that's been posed. Yeah, so um, so for, for a number of reasons, um, removal of seals, which is the, the manage, management tool of choice in the 19, uh, 1900s, um, was, is not the first choice now. So there's a number of things. One, one is, as I said, is trying to get a handle on what's the interaction between big killer whales, harbor seals, and harbor porpoises. And is there some point at which we could see the big killer whale population controlling or redu re even reducing the abundance of seals or altering their behavior just because the seals are now scared to go in the water because there's predators out there. They may be less bold or maybe uh, less able to get access to large groups of um, salmon coming out of rivers. Another is to alter our hatchery practices to not release every single Chinook in a two week period in, in May so that the seals, which are very smart, 
I can identify what time of year it is and where to go. And they'll go just sit in the stream of juvenile um, salmon that come out of a river and they don't even have to work very hard. Even though the salmon are very small, they have a very concentrated um, access to them and it's easier for them to catch them. So maybe changing our hatchery practices, as I said, uh, increasing forage fish abundance. Uh, for, for places where we have uh, a barrier like the Hood Canal Bridge or the locks, we are looking at uh, changing the, the um, hydrology around those to make it less of a, a trap for juvenile fish. Uh, and, and then we just experimented with a noisemaker at the locks that was developed in Scotland that is a startle device, not a constant loud noise. It's supposed to be safe around cetaceans, including killer whales. Uh, and that was quite effective. So in an area where you have seals attacking adults in a narrow spot, maybe deployment of acoustic devices is a non-lethal method to reduce the impact. We're trying a lot of different things right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, we, I'm sorry to um, everybody, we couldn't get to all of the questions. I think some were answered um, in written format. Um, clearly, there's just a whole lot going on, multiple stressors, and uh, there's definitely some sentiment of sadness amongst the comments um, from, from people who are, who are watching, um, but we, um, we really appreciate all of your input um, to all of the speakers. Thank you so much, and for all the good work that you're doing to, to help the whales. Um, and Caroline is going to give offer us um, some closing comments and let's see if we can get Caroline on screen. Oh, here, here she go. is. Still here. Can you see me? I can't. We can. See. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Can we put just pop that one slide on, Ruth? It's, it's up. Oh, oh I, I see what you mean. I just see the whole both. Just the one. Just the one. Just the the second slide, Ruth, if that's possible. Anyway, I Ginny did it. The, thank you for the panelists. Um, holy cow, this was a fantastic webinar, you guys. And thank you so much for taking the time to put together these presentations. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you everyone who attended and took the time and hopefully didn't miss your dinners. And uh, thank you, Ginny, for moderating. You did a great job. And Ruth and Robert for doing our behind the scenes tech support. Definitely would not have been possible if I was putting that all together. <laughs> and to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which funded this and other work events that we're doing and private donors to the Northwest Straits Foundation. So we really appreciate it. There's a, a whole host of activities happening in Puget Sound this week around Orca Recovery Day. And we have one up next tomorrow night, actually. We have an Orca Trivia Night that we're hosting. And you can go to our website, our social media to find out about that. I won't read out all the codes and what have you. Um, but thanks everyone, this was just great. Who doesn't love an Orca whale? And I love, the dog that joined you, Giles, for your <laughs> your closing panel. I'm so glad that she got to be part of the panel. <laughs> Yay. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you all and have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Stay Bye. healthy. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Rich. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Time for a glass of wine. <gasps> Woohoo!